And that was why we were very pleased to have discovered that Anna Benjamin, about 20 years ago, wrote a book about the Barbie slave rebellion, not one that is thick in academic literature, so it's very difficult to understand, but something that has been very accessible so that children can understand it. And we have been able to publish that book through the Caribbean press, and that book is now available. And while we'll be putting a very small quantity of the book on sale at the Austin Bookstore, we'll be making most of, uh, most of the books available to the libraries, in our schools, and of course, at the National Library. And we feel by doing so, this work, uh, which is really targeting school children, that's the audience that the book was really written uh, for, that they would be able to read it and get a more profound understanding of what happened in 1763. In fact, the chronology, very often when people think about 1763, when you read the regular history texts, you don't get a sense of the chronology. This book spent a lot of time putting it in sequence so that you go from day to day understanding what happened. And I think it's really an excellent piece of work and I really recommend it to all the children who are here with us, especially those who would like to learn more about the history of our country. You have heard from Nirvana that the center, one of the objectives of this small and humble center is really to have important bits of information regarding 1763. And today when we open the center, you'll be able to see some artifacts pertaining to 1763. You'll be able to see some books and reference material on 1763 rebellion. Um, and there are of course a number of uh, plaques, if you like, that we did giving people a better understanding of what happened in 1763. We would like people to come uh, to the center and go around and learn a little bit more about what happened. I think when you ask a lot of children about 1763, the first thing that they will tell you, they will say the coffee money. And that's great because we are able to remember the event uh, by one of the main actors of the 1763 coffee. But 1763 is not just coffee monument. There are many things that happen, and therefore we need to understand what happened. What are the consequences? What was the impact of 1763? I think that's very important. So while we have embedded in the minds and the consciousness of people is what the center would be able uh, to do. We in the ministry, uh, we recognize that uh, the site of that we, you know, we need to do more development on the site. And through the National Trust, we had embarked on a site development plan uh, more than a year ago. And the visitor center is one such development. But then, when we start working on the site, one of the things that was very, very disturbing is that people who come to visit the site, to visit the monument, they tend to litter in and around the monument. And you would see at the base of the monument, uh, there's a nice uh, area there with water. And very often people would dump uh, styrofoam boxes in there, and it becomes a very unpleasant sight. And some years ago also, uh, you know, we, we have, we've had a pump there sometime, we have had lights. I don't think a lot of people can recall uh, the lights that used to shine onto the monument. Uh, not many people perhaps would have recalled the fountain that was there, because for many years it was not working. And what really happened was that every time you install the pump, there would be people who would steal the pump, take out the fittings, and 
the function would not work. And so we decided that yes, we need to um, fix the monument up in the sense of restoring the fountain and we'll be working on putting in the lights. But before we could have done anything, we had to install security on the site. So right now we have 24 hours security at the site and it's really to tell people, hey, behave yourself, don't do this, don't do that. And very often the guards themselves will complain that when they try to tell people not to uh, dispose of their garbage or litter the place, that people will be very abusive to them. Now the reason I'm saying this is because it is our site. It's a, a, a national, it is this country's pride. And if we, as the citizens of this country, cannot protect a national asset, then something really is wrong with us. We shouldn't even have a guard here. We should have this pride embedded in us that we would take care of it. And anybody seeing somebody doing the wrong thing would say to them, this is wrong, don't do that. If somebody is going to litter, tell them to pick it up. That's not the right thing to do. But we hope to get there. And for now, we will have the guard to make sure that this happens. And we have now restored the fountain. And those of you who came in, you would have seen the water flowing after so many years. And I think that's a very pleasant thing. Late in the year, we will of course work to restore the lights. And uh, hopefully by the end of the year, we can have the lights uh, up. And it will also present a very beautiful site for this one. But we're not stopping here because we want to enhance the entire area uh, around the monument site. And uh, we are talking about that and we hope that we can work with several partners as we develop this part of the site. One of the things that, uh, that is not there right now, but I would insist that we put copies of it in this uh, resource center, or this uh, visitor center, is that just last week, we had the privilege of having uh, Dr. Wagner uh, from the archives of the Netherlands coming to Guyana, spending some time with us. He created an exhibition dealing with 1763 and also is right now uh, working with us on another project dealing with uh, sugar. But during his visit, uh, he did two things. He brought from the archives of the Netherlands some very old maps relating to the whole uh, Burmese area, perhaps the maps of what it looked like uh, during 1763, uh, with the names of the plantations and so forth. So he's given us digital copies uh, of those maps, and we'll be using uh, the maps that he's given to us to actually map out the area where the rebellion took place and to put down historic markers. In fact, some of that work has already started, but I think with these maps, we will have a better understanding of where these plantations were located and so forth. So we'll be doing that. But another very significant thing that he did, he brought copies of the four letters that was dictated by Coffee um, and presented them to us. Now uh, we have the, 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 the putting the copies that he gave to us at the National Archives, but we make replicas of those letters and we'll be putting them here in this resource center along with the translation because uh, it is done in Old Dutch and we need to have the translation in English so that when you see the Old Dutch, you can also understand what it meant in English. So we will find a very special place in this visitor center where we can put that because I think the contents of the letter is very instructive. And so when you come to visit uh, the, the monument, apart from the features of the monument and so forth, I think you can also have an additional learning experience by going into the visitor center and be able to immerse yourself, perhaps, 
transport yourself back in time so that you can better understand what took place uh, during 1763. This year, as we mark the 250th anniversary, uh, we are doing some other things. Uh, we, we have started a distinguished lecture series. We are very uh, privileged to have uh, Dr. Hilary Beckles, Dr. Alvin Thompson, and on the 28th of this month, we'll be having another uh, well-known historian, very eminent historian, coming from Jamaica, uh, Dr. Virin Shepherd, who will be doing uh, the last in the distinguished lecture series. So persons who would have missed the previous two, I want to encourage you uh, to come to the, to the last one in the series, because I think uh, it is very important that we understand our history and through the research and work that these eminent historians who have done in giving us a better insight into what happened during this period of slavery. In fact, uh, last Tuesday, when we had the presentation from Dr. Thompson, I think, um, although people might say it's so removed in the past and it happened so many years ago, the cruelty of some of what took place, uh, I think, moved him to actually, um, he was very emotionally moved. And he had to pause on the podium for quite a, a bit uh, to recompose himself to move on. But it was very touching because, um, you know, a lot of what happened there, I don't think people in these more modern times can actually uh, visualize, can actually understand. Uh, sometimes you read it, but you, you really can um, maybe immerse yourself in, in what took place. And some of these lectures are helping us to do that. It perhaps is also instructive that one of the other publications that we did uh, in the Guyana Classic series called Hearing Slaves Speak actually gave cases that was tried by the fiscal in the 1800s. Because at the time, uh, the fiscal used to, you know, he, made, he would get his pay by how many cases he listened to. So they actually sat there and listened to cases, but maybe never really dispensed justice. Uh, but they recorded all these things very copiously. And so now when you go back and you look at these cases, you can see the injustice. It's like a window into time about what happened uh, during the period of slavery. So it's very instructive, and I think, um, you know, as a nation, as a people, this is part of our history, our legacy, and we need to understand it, we need to read more about it, and each one of us, I think if we understand that, it will make us into better citizens of Guyana, because we will truly appreciate the sacrifices of our ancestors. Apart from 1763, we want to also broaden people's horizon on this whole question of slavery and the impact that slavery had in society. And so in the year of uh, designated by the UN as the International Year of People of African Descent, the Liverpool Museum uh, did a beautiful exhibition on slavery. Uh, not just in, in say, Guyana, but slavery as a whole. And after the year uh, concluded, they gave that exhibition to UNESCO Paris. And uh, we have been in contact with UNESCO Paris. And during this year, that exhibition is going to come to Guyana. So that I think people here can have a broader uh, appreciation of this horrendous system of slavery. And so that, I want you to look out for that as well. So there will be many activities as we uh, mark the 250th anniversary of the Barbisley uprising. And this is just one of the many things that we've been doing. And we encourage people that during this year, during 2030, that perhaps those of us who don't like to read a lot that we can at least 
read some of the publications that are coming out, um, especially dealing with our history, and come out to some of the events that we are having. We'll be doing events uh, here in Georgetown, but we'll also be taking events out into the region. Uh, we have the mobile exhibition that we'll also be taking out uh, into the region. And for organizations who are interested in hosting the mobile exhibition, uh, we, will, we are willing to work with you. What you have to do is contact the National Museum and they'll be able to work with you. Schools, we encourage schools to uh, come on board and sign up for this program so that you can get that mobile exhibition uh, to the schools. And to the teachers, we want you to incorporate this uh, into their curriculum. As you teach history, as you teach a little bit more about Guyana, put these things in and use the material that is being generated now so that our children can really learn more about what took place in our history.